this uh, repetition of the law. Uh, anybody know how you learn things? Repetition. You just keep pounding in. Uh, I meet people all the time. Well, I just, I just can't remember. Well, me either, but if you just beat it in enough, pretty soon you're going to leave some marks. <laughs> you, you'll leave an impression of something, and uh, the, more you, uh, the more you try, the more you'll get. All right, uh, chapter 24. I, I, didn't, I don't know why I didn't put a mark in my Bible here. I know we got, it, uh, got started on it. Uh, I'm going to jump down here to uh, verse 3 and 4. Let, let me read the whole thing. Let's just start. We only got three or four verses, I'm sure, done. And then we'll pick up from uh, about verse 3. When a man take, hath taken a wife and married her, and it come to pass that she, uh, she find no favor in his eyes, because this isn't just a matter of uh, the way the Pharisees saw this, that, well, I just uh, think I can do better. <laughs> Or I think I can do something else. It's uh, there's there's a matter of uncleanness there. It's not a matter of just I just decided I changed my mind uh, because he hath found some uncleanness in her. Then let him write her a bill of divorcement and give it in her hand and send her out of his house. So he basically writes her a letter. You're a free woman. Go and uh, just move along. And when she is departed out of his house, she may go and be another man's wife. Uh, that would fly in the face. Uh, I realize we're Old Testament here, but this idea of uh, uh, anybody that marries after they've been uh, married once is an adulterer. Well, it's kind of interesting. God allows that man to put that wife away for uncleanness in her, and he puts no, uh, no claim against her that she can't be married. Just uh, some standards, but no, no, no forbidding of it. And if the latter husband hate her, so she gets married again, and write her a bill of divorcement, and giveth into her hand, and sendeth her out of his house, or, or if the latter husband die, which took her to be his wife, her former husband, which hath sent her away, may not take her again to be his wife, after that she is defiled. For that is abomination before the Lord." Uh, this idea of just sort of a rotation or shift work on, on marriage is not uh, in God's plan. But uh, what I've noticed through all of these things here is there's somebody that's typically the innocent party or someone who's the less guilty party or someone who through uh, circumstances or no devices of their own finds themselves on the wrong end of these divorces. And God seems to be quite gracious in it. And some of the, uh, the brethren uh, wouldn't be. Uh, it's most preachers, uh, I shouldn't say most, but a huge number of preachers, I'll put it that way, follow along on party lines or school lines on these things. And they, they begin establishing their own sort of uh, secondary issues of marriage and all those kind of things. Uh, and it's for the same reason that the New Bible is left out part of uh, John chapter 8. They believe that if you allow uh, a remarriage, that it encourages divorce. Well, I uh, frankly don't know anybody uh, that I would consider a, a Bible believer who encourages divorce for anything other than uh, biblical standards. But he certainly does recognize that every person who's a Bible believer has no control over somebody else and whatever they do. Uh, why, why would you bind somebody? We'll look at the verses here in a minute. But why would you put somebody else under that compulsion to uh, be, uh, be beaten or abused or, or whatever by, uh, by someone? And God doesn't seem to do those things. God is very gracious in these things and very tenderhearted towards uh, offended parties. So, but he does set, uh, set standards. So uh, this man is not allowed to take her to wife again, number one. Uh, he would be married already, and it would be just a, a situation of convenience. All right, verse, uh, verse uh, 5, When a man hath taken a new wife, he shall not go out to war, neither shall he be charged with any business, but shall be free at home one year, and shall cheer up his wife, which he hath taken." Uh, I, I don't know how you read that, but it looks to me like God has a pretty good estimation of uh, women 
have a tougher time in a marriage than men do. Uh, a woman's relationship with a man is usually based on uh, on emotion and sentiment and and uh, that kind of commitment. Uh, a man's commitment it would seem to be much more superficial. And some of the verses we look at, they sound on the surface just so completely carnal that you think, man, why would God ever put something like that in a book? Uh, I think God got a pretty good estimation of who we are. And here even recognizes that wife, uh, she might have thought that was Prince Charming, but after a while she's going to maybe think of him in a little bit different terms. And uh, there's some things scattered throughout the scriptures that would lead you to believe that maybe there's a whole lot more to marriage than just two people living in the same house. Uh, so anyway, let me uh, let me back up here on, on this divorce business. Uh, save your place there. I, we may or may not have enough time to get back there. But look with me in Matthew chapter 5. We're going to pick out some highlights here and see if we can support us, uh, sort these out. If you've got a question, uh, hang on and uh, maybe we'll answer it. And if we think we're getting close and I don't, by all means, uh, you ask and we'll. Uh, you're going to deal with people like this. You know, the, the idea of uh, church and divorce, I know, uh, I, I can't think of his name now, but I remember preaching, bragging years ago, he didn't have any divorced people in his church. And I thought, man, that is, that is, that's a blessed situation, but I don't know where in the world he is, because uh, I don't know anybody that uh, doesn't have a, uh, probably half the congregation either divorced or in some circumstance like that. Uh, Matthew chapter 5 in verse uh, 31. It hath been said. So uh, this is what they were saying in the time of Jesus' day. Whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. Well, that's we just read Deuteronomy 24 and there are circumstances for that. But it seems like uh, people take opportunities and they make circumstances and they begin bending the rules for favorite people and for some people and uh, making them a little stiffer for others. And I think God wants a fair and a just balance. Uh, but I say unto you, says the Lord Jesus, that whosoever shall put, his, put away his wife saving for the cause of fornication committeth her to commit adultery, and whosoever shall marry her that is divorced committeth adultery. Uh, that's a pretty tough kind of situation to be in. That would seem to preclude divorce for every reason but fornication. And if you are not a dispensationalist, you probably would end it right there, and you'd end up as nutty as Bob Jones University is, and as nutty as some of the other people are. And uh, I, I, I've mentioned this before. There's a preacher uh, local here, and his his take from Bob Jones and his own thinking on this that uh, if you're going to be a, a, a deacon or a pastor or a Sunday school teacher. If you're married and your wife dies, you can't get married again. And the reason being that uh, uh, you're supposed to be the husband of one wife. But uh, if your wife dies, how many wives do you have? You don't have any. She died. She's gone. Uh, if your wife leaves you, how many wives do you have? You don't have any. She's gone. You may still have a piece of paper. You may still have a, a commitment in your heart. And I'm not trying to minimize those things, but quite frankly, they're gone. And uh, these guys need to wake up to the fact if God doesn't hold the standards they do. And what they've really is become in these things is Pharisees setting their standards above those that God lays out with the same idea that these guys leave out the uh, woman taken in adultery. Uh, if you read the, the footnotes in most Bibles, uh, a lot of those Bibles leave those verses out because they think that it teaches adultery or loose living. When the Lord's mercy on it was go and sin no more. I just I mean, it really is just that simple. God is very gracious. Men aren't unless there's something to be gained in it for themselves. But he goes on here uh, describing this thing in Matthew chapter uh, uh, 
chapter 5, and it says here, uh, I'm looking at the wrong one. Let me, let me, I'm pushing myself in the wrong direction here. Let me uh, spread it out just a little bit. Matthew chapter 19. I'll, I'll take these kind of in the order that I've got them written down here. Matthew chapter 19. Interesting, uh, if you're not a dispensationalist, you'll also have a big problem with these. Under the law, there was a standard that uh, was given, and there was also the uh, exceptions that the Pharisees wrote for people of import and, uh, and note that uh, were not, uh, not scriptural. Matthew chapter 19 and verse, uh, verse 5 the Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him. So you know they're not trying to be honest. They're trying to look for a way to hang him. And saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put, his, put away his wife for every cause? Well, isn't that interesting? Words mean things. Every cause? I didn't like the dress she wore. I didn't like the way she got her hair cut. Uh, I didn't like the way she looked at me the other day. So you just dismiss her, like the, kind of like the Muslims do. Uh, and he answered and said unto them, Have you not read? It's interesting that when the Lord comes with these people, he didn't say that to the common people. You know why? Because they weren't in charge of the Bible. They weren't in charge of dispensing information, but the lawyers, they were. And he says, Have you never read? Don't you read the laws that, that God has given you? Have you not read that, that he that... Uh, made them at the beginning, made them male and female. Uh, that'd be an interesting note to take up in uh, colleges around the country today, I guess. Uh, not the other 57 varieties of whatever they, they think that is. Uh, it's interesting. They, they want to do away with the, uh, the idea of male and female, but somehow it's a wonderful thing to have a female vice president. Well, why? What difference would it possibly make? We're not supposed to notice that. Unless you're a hypocrite and then you beat people to death with your stupidity. At any rate, uh, and, and said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. It's interesting that God gave that example early on to Adam, and uses it later on to describe the relationship he wants with his church. We'll say, well, when I got saved, I didn't become a female as part of the bride of Christ. No, that's an analogy. And the analogy is, I am bone of his bones and flesh of his flesh. I've been joined to him in such a way as to be inseparable from him and a part of him. That ought to be the marriage relationship in a, in a couple that will work on that. A couple, not one person that will work on that. It takes two people, 100% of everything they've got, maybe a little more sometimes, to make that relationship work. But there's always a way. Uh, verse 6, Wherefore they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. Uh, you know, in the early days, the colonial, uh, I say states, but territories, wouldn't recognize a Baptist marriage. They wouldn't, you couldn't get a marriage license. You couldn't have a marriage recorded anywhere if you were a Baptist. And they looked at you as not only a heathen, but also as an adulterer if you claimed to be married and your children as bastards because they didn't have any pedigree from a marriage license. And the reason was is because you didn't get baptized to get your sins washed away in one of their congregational churches or one of their uh, uh, Presbyterian churches or, or, and so forth. They, they immediately lost sight of how a man saved, what a man saved from, and what the relationship is. They could no longer gather the analogies or the illustrations. They began perverting even them. All right, so God joins together. Say, well, I wasn't joined in church. Well, I, you could still uh, look in a very reasonable manner that God has joined a man and a woman together because if they break up, they are divorced and it's still in God's eyes, a, it was a, a joining, a union that uh, he blessed for the purpose of children. They didn't, couldn't fulfill the rest of what God's plan was, but we'll look at that uh, toward the end of this. Then he goes on to say, uh, verse 7, they say in him, why, 
Why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement and put her away? Now, it's interesting the Lord's answer to this. And you don't read this in the Old Testament other than if a man find uncleanness in her, and he wants to, because Joseph found what he perceived immediately to be uncleanness in Mary, didn't he? She's with child of something else, somebody else. He says, but being a just man, he listened to what God said. He didn't have to do that. A divorce, not a have to circumstance. Uh, why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement and put her away. And he, that is Jesus, uh, saith unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts. You know what, the, what that every divorce comes to? The hardness of someone's heart. Unforgiveness, uh, an unyieldedness. And uh, listen, I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to be difficult and I'm not trying to be judgmental or harsh. I know it's, it's I, I pray to God, I never find myself in that situation because it, it really is a, uh, an incalculable burden on the heart, uh, whichever side of that you're on. But uh, the Bible is the Bible. Because of the hardness of your heart suffered you to put away your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. Imagine that. From Adam to Moses, you violated God's desires if there was a divorce. Under Israel, they had other reasons for these marriages as well, and it had to do with land and possessions and properties and all of these other issues that become now almost overwhelming to what God said about anything. Uh, today, it's everybody worried about their finances and their money, and who could blame them? But uh, the principle of putting God first is lost uh, to bring a marriage in there by somebody. You can't force somebody to stay married any more than you can force somebody to stay if they don't want to. And he goes on. Uh, and I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, shall marry another, and, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whoso marrieth her which is put away, doth commit adultery. Uh, In uh, some churches, if you've been divorced and it was for adultery, if you were married and divorced before you got saved, that doesn't draw a single distinction. You could kill somebody and be forgiven from it in that church, but you couldn't be divorced and be forgiven. It's just a, a weird circumstance. And it's kind of like some preachers, that's all they got left to hold on to. <laughs> they haven't been divorced. Uh, I think they find themselves, quite frankly, in God's opinion, I, I, I'm presuming to say this, in the place of the Pharisees. Well, I'm not divorced, so I'm going to make that the unpardonable sin. I mean, is, isn't that what it is? Granted, there'd be problems and trials, but uh, there are in every other uh, kind of thing, too. So there's an exception there for, uh, I would take it, for remarriage if an innocent man or an innocent woman finds himself in divorce, uh, and uh, their partner who had uh, been adulterous or, uh, or fornicated, that person is at liberty to move on with their life. Uh, the Bible is clear about that, and we'll look at that in a minute. I don't know that that's a question in anybody's mind. But uh, here's the response that, that this goes, uh, goes to. Verse 10, his disciples say to him, if the case of the man be so with his wife, it is good not to marry. They're, they're looking at this and realizing, man, that, that, that's a tough way to go. You, you, have, you, you can't do anything except that. What about just somebody you're just fighting with all the time? What about this? You know, it used to be uh, the marriage divorce rates were way, uh, the divorce rates were way down. And then they came up with, uh, anybody ever hear of a no-fault divorce? How, how can that possibly be? Well, I, I don't know, but that's what they were. And the divorce rate shot through the roof uh, just for inconvenience. But all of those things are, are ra a rather shallow commitment. And uh, listen, I would be the first one to admit that when people get married young, uh, their character isn't fully formed, their lives are not shaped, they're going, uh, growing in, in all kinds of ways. 
Uh, but if anything, that doesn't argue in favor of divorce. That argues in favor of uh, being patient and waiting until you're uh, grown up enough to make a decision that is a lifetime commitment. So, so the disciple says, good, to, <laughs> good not to marry, yeah. Uh, but he said to them, all men cannot receive this saying, save they to whom it is given. Everybody not going to fall into line with this, for there are some eunuchs. Now, a eunuch is somebody who has, uh, has been surgically altered. I'm trying to think of a delicate way to say that. So that he has, uh, is uh, unable to uh, father children and unable to perform any, uh, any physical acts that would entail, uh, encompass marriage. And it's, it's not used in a physical sense here, I don't think. I think it's used in a metaphorical sense. If you're going to be without that relationship, you would be a eunuch for such and such a reason. You've just decided real human relations uh, of that sort are not in your future. So it says, uh, verse 12, uh, for there are some eunuchs which were so born from their mother's womb, incapable, physical problems, defects, uh, whatever, uh, and there are some eunuchs which were made eunuchs of men. That used to be one of the ways that uh, you'd uh, engender faithfulness. You'd uh, kind of render this guy uh, impotent so he had no desires to, <laughs> what's the point of running around or going anywhere? Uh, I hate to be so crude, but it's practical. And there be eunuchs which have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. He that is able to receive it, let him receive it. Uh, whether Paul was a eunuch for the kingdom of heaven's sake, or whether Paul had a wife and she died, or whether Paul had a wife stashed away somewhere and chose to serve God while she sat back, uh, I don't have any idea. I, I mean, I have some opinions, but I don't have any idea of, of the of absoluteness of those things. But Paul writes about these things later on. And let's uh, look at it with me in uh, 1 Corinthians 7. Let me start at the at the back end and come back forward here. Verse uh, chapter, First Corinthians chapter seven, verse twenty six. He's been writing about uh, husbands and wives and marriage and virgins and choices people make, and he uh, in verse twenty six writes this. I suppose therefore that this is good for the present distress. I say that it is good for a man to be so. That is, uh, art thou bound to a wife? Seek not to be loose if you're married. Stay that way. Art thou loose from a wife? Seek not a wife. If your wife died, if your, your wife was a fornicator and ran off, don't look to get married. But what's the qualification for those decisions? The present distress. He's not passing this as a mandate from heaven. You can't do this and you can't do that. He's saying, listen, because we're being persecuted and hounded and hunted down and killed, you might be better off not to have to worry about taking care of a wife. You might be better off not having a family to look after for the present distress. Now, the Catholic Church uses Paul as an example of celibacy. Paul wasn't celibate because he was married to the church. If you're married to the church, that would make you a bigamist. The church is married to Christ. So yeah, that, that just won't work. So you've you got you, you to gotta think a little bit. As the, uh, the old mammy said one time, she says, Son, we ain't got no money for college. I guess you're just going to have to grow up and learn how to use your brains. Sometimes you just got to think, and it'll help you out. So uh, let's look on here. Um, verse 28, but if thou marry, thou hast not sinned. So the Catholic priests, as typical, snatch everything out of context. They have private interpretations for everything. If thou marry, thou hast not sinned. And if a virgin marry, she hath not sinned. Nevertheless, such shall have trouble in the flesh, but I spare you. In other words, what I'm telling you will save you the heartache of the problems with come. Suppose somebody comes and takes your husband away. Suppose the government comes, takes your wife away. Suppose uh, whatever. And I'm trying to spare you from that. 
Uh, a friend of mine, this is one of his favorite verses in the Bible. He always laughs when he says it. But this I say, brethren, the time is short. It remaineth that both they that have wives be as though they had none. <laughs> That's not funny. Uh, it's, it's kind of funny in a certain context there. Uh, at any rate, so what's all that about? Look back, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and ver uh, chapter 7 and verse uh, 1 through about uh, 4. Now concerning the things whereof ye wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Uh, my guess would be that was in response to this man having his, his father's wife. His 2 Corinthians is a response to whatever came back after 1 Corinthians was written to them. Nevertheless, now this, think about if somebody you know had told you this, just as an answer to your question, well, should I get married or should I stay single? Well, if you don't have any control over yourself, just go ahead and find some woman and get married. <laughs> That's what he says. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. It doesn't say let every woman have somebody else's husband or every man have some woman. It still involves the commitment before God under the Lord for marriage. And it is it illustrates clearly that marriage is a, is a multifaceted arrangement that God has provided for the needs of humankind. It provides a helpmeet for the man serving God. Adam's job was to d have dominion over the earth, subdue it, and uh, create a race of people to serve God. He couldn't do that alone. God gave him a help meet. That word meet is a fit, something that fit him perfectly, and God provided. So uh, the first purpose of marriage is a help meet for the man to serve God. It isn't just a help meet to meet your physical needs, but that is a certain aspect of that relationship. Second of all, it is to avoid fornication. If you think about what would, what would mankind be, and you don't have to look far uh, to see the illustration, what would mankind be without God's commitment of marriage? Because the heathen marry. It helps preserve children. It helps make families. It helps to make a country strong. It helps to build governments. It helps to establish a, a, a basis of operation to do things. Almost everything in the world is simply patterned after a family at one degree or another. So God put that in there in Adam so that every, every country and every race, even the heathens of the world, have standards for marriage. You think, well, if, if God didn't do it, why does every nation have it? Why is it so essential to the, to the manifestation of a solid society? And what happens to society when marriage isn't? Well, you have a barnyard, and there's no commitment. There's nothing. It's just a very base, carnival, animalistic kind of society, which is why... In the Communist Manifesto and the Humanist Manifesto, the, the one principal goal is to destroy the family. That is a satanic plot. That is not, that's not a doctrine of men. That is a doctrine of Satan to get between a man and a woman and their family and pull it apart by the, uh, like plucking wings off a fly. So it's to avoid fornication. And thirdly, it is to replenish the earth, provide a human population so that they can worship God and please God doing the things that God said, which begs the question of it again, a man that is not born again can never please God. It isn't a matter of religion. It isn't a matter of race or color or creed or anything else. It doesn't matter what you say. It's a matter of being born again to please God. It, God enables you by, the, by virtue of the Holy Spirit to do something that pleases Him. So uh, of all things, that ought to be uh, high on the uh, priority. And last of all, to train up children for the Lord. You put them in a government school, what do they learn? I will guarantee you that it won't be two generations before serving the Lord and training them for the Lord is a, is a a novel concept that is long gone. So that's, uh, that's what we need to do. Okay, so uh, moving along here, let me uh, 
Paul writes these, th these things here. And it's kind of interesting how he writes. Anybody believe we've got a perfect Bible that God has preserved flawlessly? All right, let's, this is what he says then. Verse 3, let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence. Benevolence is a kindness or a, a good deed that she deserves. If it's her due benevolence, if it's benevolence, that's something maybe she didn't. But what, what do we owe to our wives? What do we owe to our husbands? It's a relationship as brothers and sisters. And you say that today and people are... <laughs> There's no kinship. That, that whole idea of kinship is alien. We, we've lost so much that we can't even get the idea of brothers fighting alongside each other to protect one another. A brother standing up and fighting to protect the honor and, and uh, 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 protection of his sister or a sister uh, defending her brother uh, in some way against uh, slanderous things or it's kind of every man for himself. The devil, again, has had his way. So he says, uh, Likewise the wife unto the husband, verse 4, The wife hath not power over her own body, but the husband. And likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. Uh, that's a pretty interesting concept, and I, I don't want to... And it, here is not the place to discuss that to any great amount of depth, but it involves some, uh, some uh, knowing one another. Uh, both in the biblical sense and in an intimate sense of who they are, what they want, what they like, how they, how they think. And uh, I mean, just all of the parts of life. And you think, well, how in the world do you do that? Uh, if you enter into a marriage without having some level of understanding of real life, and how people think and the difference between men and women, and, you know, you've lived one of the, what they think of as a sheltered life, you're probably in for some rude awakenings, and maybe that's the case for a lot of people, uh, which possibly could be why uh, in Titus it tells you that the, uh, the job of the aged women or the older women in the church is to teach the younger women to love their husbands and love their church. Because the first thing they're going to find out is, I thought Prince Charming was Prince Charming. I find out he's some kind of, I think he's a bit of a weirdo. <laughs> yes. I don't know how you define that. I know Jim is everybody but us and Steve. But uh, is everybody with me? It's awful quiet out there. He's starting to make me nervous. <laughs> All right. At any rate, he, he says, uh, uh, boy, you think about not having power over your own body? That is a commitment to another person. That is a commitment that is one indeed. Defraud ye not one another, except to be with consent for a time. Anybody know what defrauding is? To defraud is to hold back something that belongs to somebody else. Well, if your body belongs to her and her body belongs to you, and boy, I tell you what, it would be real encouraging to, to stay together on everything, wouldn't it? You, you start letting little things build up in there, and pretty soon uh, you've got negotiations going on for anything. You've got uh, a let's make a deal kind of program going on there. Of, uh, you guess what's behind door number one, and you get this, and you get guess what's behind door number three, and you get the axe. That should not be our lives. It ought to be uh, do benevolence to one another. Defraud ye not one another, except ye with consent for time, that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer, and come together again, that Satan tempt ye not for your incontinency. But this I speak by permission, and not by commandment. Everybody said they believe the Bible, right? Is that uh, verse 6 inspired? You've got to be careful how you answer that now. Because it's in the Scripture. All Scripture is given by inspiration. It's written in the book. I think Paul gave an opinion there that uh, God gave him to put. Because it's the only thing that makes sense. If it's anything other than that, nothing that he said makes any sense. If it's just, well, depending on how I look at it, that's how the world thinks already. Uh, anyway, he says in verse 7, which kind of goes to what we talked about earlier about this uh, unmarried. For I would that all men were even as I myself, but every man hath his proper gift of God, one after this manner, one after another. I say therefore to the unmarried and widows, 
it is good for them if they abide even as I. Why? Verse 26, due to the present distress. There's, there's some practical things in that. There are probably some other things that in normal circumstances, there might be times when uh, they shouldn't marry. But you remember the, the advice Paul gives in uh, Timothy there, the, the widows are to marry and raise up children. Well, how does he say here that they should remain single? Well, because of the present distress, that's the case. So it does, you don't find the Bible contradicting itself. I, I hope everybody can, can, can get that. But if they cannot contain, in other words, the, the, the unmarried and widows, if they have no control over uh, what you could say, nothing less than their loss, just, a, just the physical drive in a, in a normal human being, if they can't control that, it led them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn. And it has to do with a state of mind that leads to a state of heart. If I can't be happy with anything but that, the Lord says, well, then do that. Because that'll take care of that issue and then put me first. He didn't say you can do that and then forget about me because you got what you wanted. It's always keep him first. We're going we're gonna to have to stop here. We're just running out of time. Uh, the other issues that we, we talked about, let me, let me just quickly, we talked about the issues for divorce. Certainly fornication is one, verse, uh, verse uh, 13. And the woman which hath an husband that believeth not, if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. So she says, well, he's, I'm a Christian, and I think it is presumed in these things that the saved person, male or female, is going to live for the Lord. And what the battle is, is they're fighting with somebody that isn't about them letting them serve the Lord. It isn't just a matter of, well, I, you know, I'm not serving the Lord anyway, and, and I just don't like this, so it'll be okay. Uh, the woman hath a husband that believeth not, and if it, he be pleased to dwell with her, let, him, let her not leave him. So... There's no sin in her staying with an unmarried man. Now, there is in a woman marrying, a saved woman marrying an unsaved man. That's dealt with at the end of this chapter. Verse 14, for the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife. That doesn't mean he's saved. That's covenant theology. That's Presbyterianism, Lutheranism, and a bunch of other garbage. Thinking that, well, you know, somebody in your family saves, so God gives you a waiver on all that stuff and everybody else is saved. It simply says they're set apart by the wife because he's not going to be involved in an awful lot of stuff. If he's allowing her to serve the Lord and allowing her to raise their children right, and allowing her to, to do what God wants her to do, he's going to have to be at least a fairly decent guy to get along with that or it's just not going to work. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife and the unbelieving wife should that be the case, is sanctified by the husband, else were your children unclean, but now are they holy. Someone is left to presumably raise them in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord, even in a mixed, what you think of as a mixed marriage, a saved and unsaved person. But, so that's, there's something there, but if the unbelieving depart, male or female, a brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God hath called us to peace. Well, if they're not under bondage, then when an a, a unsaved man leaves a saved woman, because maybe not for every reason, but if she's trying to live right and he doesn't want anything to do with it, can she remarry? Well, if she was under bondage, she wouldn't be, but if she's not under bondage, she's a free woman and allowed to do what she wants to do within the parameters of the Lord. Uh, a man that has a wife that's not saved, and this happens, uh, a guy gets saved and he likes church and likes that. His wife says, I don't want no part of that. That happens to preachers. And that, that's a horrible thing, but that happens to preachers. Uh, but if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. A brother or sister not under bondage in such cases, but God has called us to peace. For what knowest thou, O wife, whether thou shalt save thy husband? This is if they stay together. Or how knowest thou, O man, whether thou shalt save thy wife? Uh, but God hath distributed to every man as the Lord hath called him every one, so let him walk. And so I ordain, uh, so ordain I in all the churches. Uh, let's see here. Look with me in 
chapter 7 and verse uh, 37. We'll be done here in just a second. Uh, verse, back up to verse 35, and again, talking about marriage and, and uh, of single people under the circumstances. Uh, verse 35, But this I speak for your profit, not that I may cast a snare upon you. There's one of them snares that come up that what the world thinks. Are you just trying to make life miserable? No, Paul's trying to save you heartache. But that uh, which is comely, that's the way that it should be, that you may attend upon the Lord without distraction. The distraction would be spend all your time trying to keep your wife out of jail or out of trouble or away from somebody else or the wife uh, doing that. But if any man think that he behaveth himself uncomely toward his virgin, if she passed the flower of her age and need so require, let him do what he will. He sinneth not, let them marry. I, I think they're talking about age there. A woman gets to an age where she's uh, getting a little panic stricken. I, I want to have children and I'm getting up to that age and... Uh, well, then marry. You know, don't, don't make yourself insane over something else. Marry. Nevertheless, verse 37, he that standeth steadfast in his heart, having no necessity, whether of the flesh and the lust or of uh, some other circumstance, but hath power over his own will and is so decreed in his heart that he will keep his virgin doeth well. Imagine a man and a woman that can be friends all their life and never have a sexual relation. Imagine a man and a woman that can, can live as, uh, I guess you'd say, brother and sister. We look at that, that's, that's just really strange. Uh, even in Paul's day, it would have been strange. In any day, it would be strange. But he said, look, if, if you can get by with that, nothing, nothing wrong with that either. Verse 38, so then, the conclusion of this is, he that giveth her in marriage doeth well. If you get married, that's one thing. That's fine. But he that giveth her not in marriage doeth better. Why? Because of the present distress. Verse 26, the overriding principle of, of all of the discussion that he has. The wife is bound by the law as long as her husband liveth. But if her husband be dead, she is at liberty to, marry, uh, to be married to whom she will, only in the Lord. She is not permitted to marry somebody who's unsaved again. Say, well, what if she wants to? She can do what she wants. She can sin if she wants, but that's clearly not what God wants. But she is happier if she so abide after my judgment, and I thank also that I have the Spirit of God. I think that's a uh, Paulistic sarcasm, if that's a, if those are words, where he just says, uh, I think I'm talking for God. I'm the apostle to the Gentiles. He told me to write this letter. He said he's going to preserve. There's going to be scripture. So I think I'm telling you what's the right thing to do. Okay. Any questions? If not, we'll, uh, we'll be done. I know a preacher that told one of his deacons his wife died of cancer. Uh, a woman, her husband died of something. And probably two years later, they just kind of, as, as gravity and humanity will do, got together and, uh, for company and companionship and decided they wanted to get married. And that preacher uh, said, uh, if you marry her, you'll be an adulterer. You've already been married. I don't know if that guy can't count or he thinks he's just being so spiritual and so holy. And uh, he said, if you marry her, you'll be an adulterer. You won't be a deacon. They went off to New Hampshire, this guy and his wife. They laughed at the preacher, went up to New Hampshire, got married, came back, still a deacon. Everybody in church loves him. The preacher looks at him, I don't know what he's got to think they're an adulterer. I don't know what that's all about. I think there's just craziness abounding. Amen. Good to be saved, isn't it? All right. Let's stand. Anybody got a song they want to... Uh,